Yes, you are. All oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good morning and welcome to today's live webinar, ESG Strategy Execution, The Devils in the Details. There's been so much hype and theories and confusion and pressure around the topic of ESG. Many companies have invested very heavily in making sure that their strategies are clearly defined, their goals and timelines have been set and articulated and publicized. However, when it comes to actually implementing those strategic goals, how do we ensure that every daily task and transaction reflects those goals? And how do we prove that every task reflects our goals? This workshop is session four in the series, Business Transformation Through Bridgetalization. This term will be explained to you a little later, but before we begin, I would like to thank the Southern African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy for hosting this session for your benefit. And thank you to our highly esteemed panelists, each an expert in their own right in the world of ESG, for their time, input, and expert guidance, which they will be sharing with us today. And thank you to each of you for taking the time to come and learn with us on this crucial journey. Also, given your expertise and experience, we would really welcome your input and participation and encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A, which we will address during the workshop. Um, it is for your benefit, so please do ask whatever you feel would bring value um, to you, yourself and to your peers. Um, to set the scene, I'm going to play a short video. It's part of an interview from Martin Kremer that's two years old. Let's have a look at that now. Kremer Media's Mining Weekly is interviewing Dilly Naidu, the Director of Business Development at Rifle Shot Performance, a business performance company. Dilly, let's now go into this crucial issue of environmental social governance. We have recognized that we have done a dismal job of environmental, social, and governance, specifically in the mining sector. So I believe that the mining sector and mining companies need to start doing what I will call a truth and reconciliation in this area of environmental, social, and governance. And be very honest of where you are on a scale of one to 10, if that's the benchmark, of where you are in the environmental area. You should have a very definitive exit plan. And I've seen mines in South Africa that are ghost towns today. If you were conscious of the environmental, social, and governance, you wouldn't have ghost towns. You will have subsidiary industries that still exist and contribute to the workers and jobs and the economy. Other than having a template that ticks the box and says, yes, we comply to environmental, we comply to social and, and governance, but seriously make this ESG as part of the social fabric and DNA of the company. Having said that, I am starting to see more and more South African mining companies being more conscious of the communities that they operate in, in the environments that they operate in, and looking at the old governance and compliance and environment as the last thing, as opposed to leading with that. And then, G, as you mentioned, how is this being monitored? Who's watching to make sure business is conducted ethically what business processes are in place yeah i think that's a big gap martin uh, unfortunately with a young democracy uh, 28 years old uh, i would think our institutions have been very very weak in being able to to monitor the various sectors they're very good the policies that they put out etc is where it stops mm. media's mining weekly so um, given that last statement, it seems we need more clarity. The intentions are there. Um, what we need is actually the ability to proactively manage and monitor ourselves better. And who better to provide us with more clarity? Um, 
Alexandra Russell. Alex is a dynamic, results-driven attorney with a proven track record of performance delivery in governance, risk, and compliance projects with a particular focus on sustainability. She holds um, a sustainability management certificate from Cambridge University and was awarded an Africa Sustainability Leadership Award in recognition of her contribution to sustainability through thought leadership and is a lead leading a global company as a group chief risk officer. Welcome, Alex. Our next participant, Michael Juden. Michael has a keen interest in corporate governance and is a member of the King Committee and a task team which wrote King 4, South Africa's Corporate Governance Code. He is also chairman of the Conscious Leadership Academy and a director of and legal advisor to the American Chamber of Commerce in South Africa and a member of the Committee of the Financial Sector Conduct Authority of South Africa and Michael's crazy Arsenal fan. Our last panelist is Eugen Pillay, who has worked with both private and public sector at local and international levels with C-suite clients and senior government executives and leadership, primarily focused on ESG implementation, governance, and strategy enhancements. Eugen was the first United Nations accredited trainer registered in the SADC region and is one of only 60 registered globally to conduct sustainability development goals training. I'm going to hand over to our moderator, Dili Naidu, who together with our panelists will unpack where the devil lives in the details. Dili is the CEO of Rifle Shot Performance Holdings. He's also an internationally experienced business leader with over 45 years of experience in industrial sectors. He's been a dedicated martial artist and marathon runner for the past 57 years and is passionate about exploring the inner workings of ancient cultures and conceptualizing new ideas. Dilly, over to you. Thank you, Caroline, uh, for that introduction. Uh, it's very appropriate that we're meeting as a team as we learn on this new ESG journey. I have personally attended a number of these sessions myself. In fact, today I have a clash with two other invites. And this is how important the organizations and governments are taking around sustainability as well as, as ESG. Uh, you know, looking at that video interview with Martin Kramer, that a number of you are very familiar with and very respected in the mining community around the world, I noticed two things about myself in the last two years. I was wearing glasses there. And now with technology, I had what is called a cataracts operation. And I'm going to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Allison Taylor at the Gordon uh, Medical School, who did an unbelievable job of actually inserting new lens in my eyes. So at the age of 70, moving forward, I'm younger than I was 20 years ago. So if you look at the use of technology in the medical field and allied fields, it's just incredible. My mom who's in the nineties also had something like this and she called it a laser treatment. But when I look at it, it's actually an ultrasound. So, so that's the one thing that I learned reflecting on that interview with, with Martin. But today we wanna to talk about preserving the planet people while making a profit with a conscious, social conscious, you will notice as you get familiar with our organization that we one of the few companies some years ago where we say our purpose is to further enhance our clients' operational and business with a social conscious. Have a look around and examine how many companies have actually got a purpose which includes social consciousness. And hopefully after this session, we'll see more focus in that particular area. I'm really delighted this morning to be joined with such an esteemed panel. They all happen to be friends and colleagues of mine for several years. Eugen and I go back some years while he was consulting 
in the resources sector, the mining, minerals, metals, and allied sector. Alex, uh, we have a long-term relationship with the organization, Cecil. Uh, we've been supporting Cecil for some two decades from, from Rifle Shot and an incredible relationship with the organization as well as people like Alex and her team. Uh, Michael Juden is somebody that's not only a colleague, but a friend with special, special interests around the lack of governance, the corruption that's going on around the world, and the lack of ethical leadership. So I'm really, really delighted to have this conversation with these three. In addition to that, uh, Michael also chairs what is called Conscious Companies, and both Alex and I are members of Conscious Companies. That was started in South Africa, the CEO of Brenda Carley, and it's grown around the world. It's also complemented with Conscious Academy that's focusing on business, cultural transformation, and people transformation. We believe that to fix the corporation or government, you have to fix the individuals. So with that, I want to you know, spend a few moments with each one of the panelists uh, where I want to start with, with Jürgen. You know, Jürgen, as one of the only two certified United Nations certified trainers in the area of SDG ESG, if we look at the mining sector, with my experience and observation in the mining sector, on the environmental side, when minings do exploration, mine planning, and an exit plan for the life of the mine, they start off with an you know an environmental impact assessment. So they're doing something in that particular area. When I look around over the, the years on the social side, mining companies have been doing increasingly a better job on the welfare of the employees, the communities that they operate in. I've seen clinics that they've put in, educational facilities and other social activities. Most of the companies that we deal with in the mining, minerals, metals and allied sectors are publicly listed companies. So our assumption is that they have to abide by the rules of engagement as far as corporate governance is concerned. So with that, why is this focus now so much on ESG? So Ergen, you're going over to you. Thank you, Danny, and welcome to all the participants on the call. We look forward to, to, to your questions, but later on, um, I think, Danny, um, for me, um, let's start at where this at, at the, the focus it started. Um, a few years ago, there was what we call the Millennial Goals, um, and in 2015, the UN had come together, assessed these goals, and then and then, and that's where the SDGs had come from in 2015 after signing the Paris Agreement, when, when we started to note about the world started noticing these changes in the environment. And you know, when you look at the changes that you see today, whether it's the tsunamis or the, the, the heat that's causing fires, it's, there's a loss of life. There's a lot, there's so much that we're losing on. And in 2015, the, the United Nations uh, or the members from the from the United Nations came up with 17 goals, and and these 17 goals were, were were crafted around what's the issues that's happening in the world right now, and 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 a way to tackle that was if we have an idea on what the goals are and develop a roadmap, we should be heading down that that route, and. And that's where it started off from, and that's where also in terms of sustainability, uh, a few of the terms that you'll hear, you know, started coming into into light. Most recently, you would find um, a, a couple of years ago the, the the term ESG, and ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance, and and especially as you were talking about mining companies and so on, um, and many of them listed. When you have listed companies and they have to, well, basically report to the world, report what they're doing. And, 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 and this is where the ESG frameworks had, had come from. Depending on who's your audience and who's your stakeholders, there's different uh, stakeholders that uses different ESG frameworks. And the whole idea is to understand what's the role that you're playing in a better world. 
And why is it important now, Dali, as per your question, is with the last generation that can make a difference. We can't leave it for, for the next generation. Um, we have what it takes, like you say, with technology to make a difference right now and set the path and really go forward. And, and, and if you really think about it, we only have one true stakeholder and that's our planet. So, so Jürgen, you know, I lived in Geneva in Switzerland. I know where the United Nations is, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And if you look at Switzerland, it's a small country. It's largely a homogeneous country. We look sure. at developing countries and in particular South Africa. South Africa yeah. has a history of colonization. We yeah. were a young democracy of 30 years. We are multi-ethnic diversified country with different value systems. Sure. So, so if you look at the, the ESG monitoring, are there different guidelines for developed countries versus developing countries? Um, uh, yes, they are. Uh, so let me start up on the SDG side. So these are two separate um, concepts. SDG and sustainability is an inside out reflection, is how I, or my contribution to the world. ESG is an outside in, it's how the world um, perceives you and so on. So when it comes to the SDGs, it's exactly the same because we all have, are supposed to be on the same road, have the same roadmap to the goals of what we want to achieve. On the ESG side, yes, there are different guidelines because in developing countries, they may have access to the funding, to the infrastructure, um, you know, if you look at some developing countries, and I just come back from um, from a few countries in Africa, you'd see that, you know, there's not always great infrastructure, our education levels, there's, you know, there, there's different uh, priority areas for us, and therefore there's a more, there's different emphasis on developing countries versus, um, you know, uh, countries that 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 that. that, that Similarly, from your first world countries, that have different issues that they're dealing with. And Jürgen, uh, you know, given your role, where would you say South African government as a country and our corporate enterprises are today versus their sure. peers as far as SDG and ESG is concerned? All right, thank you. So, so I was personally very proud when the president signed the climate change bill. Um, because if you have to look at the detail in that bill, it does talk about a low carbon economy. It does talk about um, the plan that we need to have as a country. And therefore, um, you know, I, I believe we are on the right path to do so. We talk about investments, especially for energy. If we, if we look at ESCOM today, and I don't want to jinx anything, doing much better in terms of the electricity um, supply and so on. Um, and next year, South is going to be hosting the G20 Summit, which is fantastic for us because it gives us an opportunity to showcase uh, our progress and specifically what we want to do going forward. Um, when you look at the ESG side, and uh, we'll start at um, your, your listed companies, you'll see that they are literally keeping to the frameworks, international frameworks, and I do feel that we are reporting according to the frameworks. I think that if I had to be critical though, the devil is in the detail. Um, having a report where you, where, where you show um, you know, certain criteria and so on is great, but we need to find a way to measure the impact. So whatever entities are doing uh, or on the corporate side, first of all, uh, you know, there has to be a baseline. There has to be lessons learned. Sometimes companies love to showcase their great projects. And perhaps out of 10 projects, maybe two of them are fantastic and that gets showcased. But there's a lot of learning in those eight that perhaps have failed. And what can be done differently? And, 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 and how do you engage your stakeholders, such as to understand the environment that you're operating in and the types of impact that you have? On your entities and on your Thank stakeholders. You, so, so Alex, you know, as the group chief risk officer for Cecil, I know you've been very involved with this, with your peers locally as well as around the world. 
And if we look at the things like standards, you know, in your experience, the whole area of standards, uh, uniform standards, are there very specific standards for industry sectors, etc. We'd love to get your view on that, Alex. To try my my tech ability to just quickly share a screen, um, because I just want to show some steps while I'm answering. So, Caroline, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to say yes and just pop this screen up. Let's see if it's the right one. Um, is it saying roadmap to establish? We don't see anything yet. Yes, Not yet. Coming. Yes, yes, we have it, Alex, on my okay. screen at least. <laughs> Super. Great. <laughs> Good. Um, so, Dilly, I think just in answering you, the first thing that we're seeing, and you can start at mentioning it, we're seeing a lot of regulation and policy pushing frameworks from voluntary into mandatory. And the question then is, how are companies keeping up? How are they adapting? How are they reporting? So the reason I just wanted to share this slide was I think the first step is always to have that clear vision and to have the priorities and the heat mapping. You know, what is material? Have you engaged your stakeholders on this? And identify for yourself as a company the key topics. And with that, have the difficult conversations with the board and the exco. Um, make sure the mandate's understood. And then on the back of that, you can have your action plans for both the risks and the opportunities. And once you're in that space, now you get to the disclosure, communication. And that's where we're talking about what's voluntary, what's regulatory. Dilly, what's also very important, and I think this is where we're going to spend the time this morning, what supports all of that? So yes, a company's own operating model, it's data management, and that's something very near and dear to me. And on the back of that, assurance and governance. And data management, I think, is where we're all looking at what are the best tools. I know you're going to give us some advice here. But really what we're seeing is the ISSB now is pushing for standardization of ESG reporting. Now, in 2013, KPMG was saying that for only 53% of companies are really understanding how they can report their increased compliance, their administration. And with all of this comes burdens. Um, sometimes it's a lack of expertise. Sometimes it's a lack of clear guidelines. We're only getting some of these guidelines now. And then Morgan Stanley went on and they had a look, and it's quite a, a close one as well. They're saying in 2023, 72% of institutional investors were saying they were considering ESG factors in their investment decisions. But according to this Morgan Stanley survey, only 44% of companies were actually using current ESG data sufficient for making these informed decisions. So Dilly, I think there's a lot of room to play catch up. There's a lot of room to have much better handling of data, data-driven decisions, truly understanding what the data is telling us. And then really being harsh with ourselves and saying, are we demonstrating to others what we're able to do? So it's an exciting space. It's not an easy space. But I think there are a lot more tools that, that we're getting. So, Alex, as the chief risk officer for SASL, how do you integrate risk management as part of the overall ESG strategy? Fantastic question, Dilly. And I think for me, one of the answers to that is risk and strategy are very much flip sides of the same coin. And the new buzzword or the new drive is to get towards resilience. So do you have a clear vision? Do you have a clear strategy? That's your step one. How have you prioritized risks and opportunities around that? And then next, if one takes ESG as a checklist, one is able to start actually driving resilience. And Dilly, I have to give a punt for another South African great export. Um, it's called FutureFit. It is a free tool. So anybody can go onto their website. Please just Google FutureFit, developed by a South African. 
And what I love about it is it's a hack. So I think all of us are looking for life hacks at the moment. How can we do it quicker and better? What FutureFit does is it enables one to take one's current understanding. So these key topics that one's identified, these action plans, and it says, what does a do less harm company look like in 2050? And what does a do no harm company look like in 2050? And one can plug one's own data into these standards and understand expectations from a global perspective of what are stakeholders looking for performance-wise. And I think if one is really harsh with oneself, really holds up the mirror, um, using hacks like FutureFit, I think one can have those very key internal discussions, debates, and really be, as I say, very tough and harsh on oneself. And and in your experience, Alex, how are companies managing this? Do, you know, if you look at the whole area of integrated compliance and reporting, uh, you know, will technology and IT and software platforms help you, or is it being done manually piecemeal today? And before a board meeting, trying to assemble all this stuff together. Absolutely. So, so delete two parts to this answer. So the one is where I was heading with future fit, that authenticity. And then on the back of that, real-time data, because without real-time data, if you do not have, and it's just, it's number eight on the list here, if you do not have that strong data management with strong systems in place, you're really going to trip yourself up because you need to on a daily basis, you need to know what your data is telling you about your performance. Um, and this is where the GRI has been saying, you've got to have integrated thinking. You've got to have that integrated thought leadership and your data and your considerations around your metrics then allow these crucial conversations. And as you say, Dilly, these conversations should be ongoing. So when it's a, it's a matter of going before the board, it's part of that seamless conversation, not a mad scramble to say the board asked a crucial question. Have we got the information to give the answer? So, Alex, you mentioned data, data, data. I did a presentation yes. last year and I said data, data everywhere, but no insight, insight. Right. So what you're going to hear from my colleagues, Jesse and, and Ian, is how we can help you with technology and software tools to get the actual truth within the truth in an organization that gets to the board levels and the regulatory bodies. So Alex, thank you very much for that. I'd like to now get to my dear friend and colleague, Michael Juden. Michael needs no introduction. And uh, Michael, I'd like to start off by asking you your definition of what is commonly known as a purpose-driven organization. Good morning, Dilly, and good morning, everybody with us this morning. Thank you very much for um, inviting me. I was having difficulty getting in. I thought I was blocked deliberately. I was, when I called you, Dilly, I was very concerned. Um, so just before I come to purpose, um, well, maybe I'll do it afterwards. Okay. Well, I think that in an organization, in your family, in your personal life, until you know your purpose, until you know the why, the reason, you will never succeed. And so an organization needs to understand what is its purpose? What is it meant to do? And I think the most important part of that is moving away from it's just making a profit. So one of the things that I believe in this question of purpose and in the environment of ESG, and I'm going to be controversial, but you know that I don't like the term ESG. I think pasting together environmental issues, social issues, 
and governance issues and asking a company to understand what that's all about is completely and utterly wrong. This is about sustainability. This is about longevity. Will this, will the planet last and will this organization last? And if, when you talk about sustainability, people understand what that means. So I've, I think that a lot of the misunderstanding of what is the purpose is a misunderstanding of what environmental, social and governance, because ESG and a whole lot of other factors all fit into sustainability. And the question is, a company should ask, what is our purpose? Our purpose is to be sustainable and to uh, account to all of our stakeholders and ensure that this company will exist for generations to come. When you talk, when I talk to Japanese clients, it's so rewarding because whenever you're talking to them about something for the future, repeatedly comes up next generation, next generation. I'm doing it for them. We need to be sustainable. We need to do it. That's an understanding and that short termism, which South Africa has taken from countries like the US, is a huge problem. And just before I end, one of the great problems with this purpose issue is that sadly, there are two contributing factors. The first is when you talk about developing countries and developed countries, the tragedy is that we were on the cusp of a developed country and 30 years of stealing, corruption and inept administration have set us back I can only pray that this government of national unity is going to do something, but to ask of them to catch up 30 years is a long time. And we've been put back very badly to a developing country. One can just close your eyes and imagine where we could have been at this stage when we of this conversation had we not thrown away 30, 30 years. And the second thing, Dilly, is, and we'll come to this point a little bit later, the big problem is that the majority of the directors on boards do not understand this concept of sustainability. Many in this country do not understand the importance of sustainability and are rooted in the results that are going to be published next month. And so we spoke about it in another environment. I'm delighted we're talking to this audience, but we should be talking to the children in school, explaining sustainability to them, and they are the people best driven to train and coach their parents before they walk into a boardroom to understand what it is about sustainability. And if you listen to Alex, one of my heroes in this field, and picture pick up on some of those touchstones of hers, how she talks about opportunity coupled with risk, this huge new thing of resilience, which we learned after COVID, the ability to pivot. If we, if we become serious about sustainability and all of its subsets of which environment, social and governance are, and governance is throughout the organization, then I think we better equipped to understand our purpose and our purpose is to look after the planet as well as profit and also the people. I hope I've answered. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I can relate to that. I've been a martial artist for 57 years. I understand Japanese culture very well. Um, and what we have seen based on our observations and what you've echoed is short-term financial gains at any cost versus long-term sustainability. And that's lack of leadership. So I want to touch on some real South African situations. Uh, you've been very close to our respected professor, Judge Mervyn King, where he talks about the government or the corporation, brick and mortar is an incapacitated person. To fix the corporation, you have to fix the individual. So if we look at some companies that have been tarnished in the public domain, including the so-called most respected auditing companies, we now need auditors to audit the auditing companies. Uh, 
And, you know, you look at companies like Steinoff. Are you telling me that the board of Steinoff did not know what was going on? The executives at Steinoff, at Tongat Jilut, at PIC, the list can go on. And they all happen to be publicly listed companies. Some of them claimed they are using the King 4 guidelines. How are we going to fix this going forward? Well, you know, along our King journey, um, I've been, I was fortunate as a young lawyer when I started my studying to have in, met Mervyn, who was then and still is the hottest lawyer in town, probably the greatest legal and business brain post-war in this country. Um, and being taken along with Mervyn on this journey through King Two and then to King Three and very importantly to King Four, driven by so many important factors, Mervyn repeatedly, as you correctly say, and I know Dilly, you're close to him. He's he I know that he has a very high regard and great respect for you. Um you're absolutely right. Mervyn repeatedly tells people a company's an incapacitated being, an artificial creation. It's the directors, they're the heart, the soul, the mind the body of it. So the organization can only be as good as what its directors, its public, are, its, uh, its uh, management, its committee members are. And one of the great problems, which I touched on earlier, is, and you refer to those, to those companies, is that a lot of these directors are incompetent in a, in a current environment, digitally, environmentally, sustainability. They're rooted in the past. And we I don't want to keep on about it, but it's all about this short-termism and making a profit and making a profit at all costs. Um, and as far as the auditors is concerned, we've had this discussion before. I'm not protecting the auditors, but they're not responsible for the accounts. And they aren't brought in to do a forensic. Clearly, sometimes there's negligence on their part. But you can't, one can't turn to the auditors of Tongat. One needs to look at the directors of Tongat, the public officers, the committee members the, of, of Tongat. They're responsible for the accounts and the numbers. And the auditors are not there to do a forensic. They are there to discharge their obligations in terms of the stat their statutory obligations. But you've got to look at the directors. And so the very important thing is that, as we often say in the governance world, how do you have good governance? You can only have it in one of two ways, Dilly. You can have it where there's a culture of governance in the country. After a sporting event in Japan, the people stay behind to clean the stadium. If you drop a bangle in the stadium, it will be handed in to the lost and found office and you'll go back the next day and collect it. It's a culture. Yeah. The only other way you can do it is for using the Australian example, where there is the most ruthless monitoring and penalties and consequences of not doing it. So their wardens, their police, their monitoring systems are such that if there is any breach, you are it, it's investigated, you are punished drastically. So in a country like that, they are scared not to do it properly. In a country like Japan, some of the Nordic countries, it's just a culture. It's the only way that you do it. Yeah. In South Africa, what during this law, particularly during this last period, and not only looking at this period, looking at the period before 1994, in that period, there, were, there was consequence. And we moved into an era, there was no consequence and there was no culture. Now, for the very first time, there are green shoots and there's a flicker of hope 
with this government of national unity. And I think what we have to do, and particularly in the governance world, we hoping now that we're going to see not only lip service, but an embracing of King, the principles of good corporate governance, and that we're going to move forward. But if we look back on the past 30 years, we can only de become depressed and negative. We have to, we are starting again. And so at King, we're taking, we're engaging now with people who are now prepared to listen to us, people that give us an audience. And we're hoping together with incredible outstanding institutions like the JSE and with auditing firms who are very serious now and others that we're going to see a different environment here. But as Merv, Mervyn ever said, always says rather, we always knew that that the King Code was written. We never, ever thought that that code would make a thief honest. We gave the country a code to use, as the judge did in Dudu Miyani's case, where she took the code and punished dramatically for not observing it. So thank you, Michael. So you've hit something that's very close to us. So at our organization, we talk about not values-based leadership. We talk about values-based living, how I live my life, how I behave from the time I get up in the morning till the time I go to sleep. So that's a totally, totally different way of living to what we see in the world today and in South Africa. And I will go on to say that through Conscious Academy, the discussions I'm having with our counterparts, Dr. Jan Bergerman, who is a clinical psychologist, that the cultural transformation and the people and employee transformation is a precursor to ESG. So that's something that we will be embarking on. Is uh, Part of my profile from my global travels, my observation is that people are influenced or conditioned by the immediate environments. And so culture that you touched on, Michael, is very, very important. You know, it so happens that I have a 13-year-old granddaughter who lives in Cape Town. I was with her and took her to buy her some clothes. And she said to me, Tata, you can't buy that. I asked her why. She said, it's not re recyclable material at 13 years old. So there's consumer activism at very, very young ages now. Employees are looking at leaving the existing companies because they're not eco-friendly. When I was a kid in a farm, we had horses and cows. And in the stables, my grandfather, because it got messed up, used to say whitewash the walls. But I've heard a new term now called greenwashing. The fact that we have something like greenwashing since ESG has been established is a very, very big concern to me. So why is this term greenwashing suddenly come about? So, Billy, it was inevitable that dishonest organizations would lie about the extent to which they were complying with ESG. Um, um, I think this country will catch up. Uh, Alex knows well, because we, we communicate with each other on it, that there have been some very notable court cases around the world um, holding directors and officers liable for greenwashing, which is just nothing else but fraud. And now, of course, the world is just, and it's just burst upon the world. We've now got another one. We've moved with greenwashing, and that's the new term, which is just weeks old, which is AI washing. Um, and what companies are now doing is because people believe mistakenly, people who have no clue how to prompt, have no idea what AI actually means. Some of them think it's a motorway, but believe that it Im it's impressive to tell people that they've used AI in their the results and what they're publishing, and none of it is true. So now what is now being investigated are these claims of artificial intelligence being used, and so we've now got greenwashing and AI washing. And so there will always be the thieves, there will always be those who take an opportunity, see a gap, and have to be carefully monitored, which comes back to my point of 
it's going to take a long time here if we focus on South Africa to have the culture. But we can move immediately into consequence. So when my late mom lost a, a treasured necklace when she was visiting my sister in Australia and got home and discovered it, my sister's response to her was, don't worry, mom, we'll go in the morning, it'll be at the lost and found office. Because if anybody was seen taking it, they'll go to prison for a long, long time. And it was there. So culture, let's start in the schools. Let's start now building a culture. And I must tell you that I think we can catch up quickly because there's a lot to learn from African culture in this field of doing things correctly. And we need to look very closely. And I think our African brothers and sisters can help us greatly with that. So there's a, I think we can culturally catch up. I'm not negative about that. But for now, we need our justice system to show consequence that we can do immediately and we can then work on a culture. And just before I hand over to others, your story about your daughter is perhaps you've heard me on this. I mean, I'm like a dog with a bone on this. That pester power, sustainability is going to come from the children. When the children are taught at school as they are, and they're given lists of what products to buy, and when that translates into a no profit in the organization, because the kids are telling their parents not to buy that product, because that's not a sustainable product or organization, then they'll stand up and take notice. So you know where the future is. The future is with your granddaughter. Yeah. And she's to be applauded for what she did. And I hope that she spreads that through the whole family and that the whole Naidu family becomes only buying products that are green. She, that is the most important thing for, for me from what we've heard today. Thank you, Michael. So I just saw Professor Mervyn King just launched a new book called The Corporate Revolution, and I'll be anxiously looking forward to reading it. It's um, a wonderful book. David Williams wrote the book. Uh, he's a brilliant author, and he tells Mervyn's life and a lot of the stories. Um, not all the stories. Some of the stories are, are only Mervyn's little circle now. But he tells a lot about this incredible human being. It's a fabulous read. It's being launched in August. Yeah, I will certainly have it on my bookshelf. And it's already okay. available. So given our time, I would like to thank uh, Michael, uh, Alex, and Jürgen for their contributions. We could spend days, many workshops on this. But this is just a taste of the limited time that we had to cover some of what I thought were the, the key issues. So, so with that, uh, thank you very much. We're now going to move into the next part of the presentation outside the panel discussion and, and basically want to look at an organization and a typical organization. Uh, if we can move to that organization chart, Caroline. So before Jesse comes on and demos and shows you the software platform that we have, if we look at ESG and a typical corporate organization, who are the stakeholders and the participants? So if we start from the bottom up, whether it's in the mining sector, the oil, gas, petrochemical sector, or the manufacturing and industrial sectors, it actually starts at the bottom. And you heard Alex say many times about data, data, data. This is where the data resides. It resides at the coal face and bringing all that data up into the operations and then getting into the financial areas, the administration areas, HR, et cetera. And then of course, getting to the community and the external stakeholders, the regulatory bodies, as well as ultimately to the board of directors. So with that, I hand over back to, to Caroline and look forward to the presentation and, and demos for the rest of the morning. 
Thank you. That, that was really insightful. I think um, one thing that Alex said, um, you know, the frameworks pushing from voluntary to mandatory and having things be mandatory, I find people meet that with resistance because it's forced. Um, but as Michael said, sometimes that is quicker than changing the culture. Um, and, you know, just the reflecting on what you can said about sustainability being an inside out job. And then also talking about knowing purpose and authenticity and resilience. I think there's a, also a lot of fear around being authentic because the, there's punishment that comes with that. And it's a very difficult balance to attain. So I'm going to hand over to Jess, who is expert at making integrity visible. Um, Jess is the CEO of International Sales at Soft Expert. He has 30 years of experience in IT, including consulting services on over 500 companies in, during that period. And he leads and really motivates and inspires a team of champions to overseeing all operations and business activities to make sure they produce the desired results and are consistent with overall strategy and mission. And the mission is sustainable business excellence. Jess? Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, everybody, for being present in this uh meeting and I'm very happy to uh, talk about uh, how a software solution can help uh, implement a very efficient uh, ESG uh, solution. So this is very important. We see how important it is to have ESG as part of the organization strategy. As Michael said, uh, in, we no longer can keep on that pace. Just uh, companies cannot just be great about profitability. We need to go to a more sustainable model. So uh, we mentioned that data is very important. Monitoring, being, bringing transparency to data is something that our company needs to do. Uh, one of the most used uh, framework for ESG is the GRI. Uh, so. GRI is basically a report that brings transparency and bring visibility to uh, ESG initiatives in a specific organization. Um, very important to mention that, you know, a software is not just the solution for that, but it's part of the solution. We need to use IT as a, a tool because this is a culture that also needs to be developed. So that's very important part. So solution is a very important tool, but it's not the end solution. The end solution comes from the human being nature, and we need to realize that culture is something that you need to be changed. Um, I, I want to start to share my screen so you guys can actually see what I'm talking about. I guess you can see now, uh, I define five, five key steps to implement a, uh, a comprehensive and effective uh, ESG. So let's go to those steps to see how can technology help. And we're going to discuss and also try to mix between uh, the, the, the PowerPoint presentation, also the other screens that are the software itself. So implementing SG solution successfully involves strategic and a structured approach. That's very important. You need to have a strategy and you need to be consistent uh, on that strategy. Uh, so what is that would be the first step according to, to main of the, 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 the consulting company over the world. So that's, that's not my idea is just I collect that from many organizations. Uh, first thing we need to understand that executive support is crucial. 
we need to have leadership involved on the ESG. So it has to be a top-down thing. It, we need to have a clear, defined leadership for taking care or leading the ESG initiative. Basically, that is very important. So defining a, a ESG governance body, it's essential. And then you need to define the roles, assign those roles, because that 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 committee, that governance team need to be accountable and need to enforce accountability over the organization. Because that is one of the most important thing, how you enforce governance. Because as I, I, I on my on my way of seeing things, the G, the governance side of the ESG is one of the, if it's not the most important because without governance the other environmental and social initiatives are not going to work so defining a clear governance team is one first step define the roles the responsibilities creating a committee it's very important so i want to share another screen so how we as a software platform as a software solution uh, please, can you guys see that new screen? Jess, we can see step one, establish leadership commitments. So I will stop share and share it again so you can see the this screen. Jess, we could see you clearly previously. Okay, let me start. Now I guess you guys can see that screen. Yes. So basically here, yeah, how a software can help on that sense of defining the role. So in our solution, you can define your organizational chart, and then there you connect every part of the organization. And then you can clearly see when you look at the, the flow chart of the organizational chart, the roles in the company. You can see there is a committee that's responsible for ESG. Uh, and then you can just break it down and the, the components, the, the participants on that, and the role they have into the organization and also in the ESG. So this one first thing, you click, everyone that comes to your organization can see the organizational chart and they can see there is a ESG body, ESG department, and then you can see all the, the uh, people that are enrolled on that department, including the position uh, and responsibility. This is something that the software helps to define and then you can share that and you can use that in an in a, in a, uh, uh, you know, organizational chart. You can have more complex ones like this one here. So basically the system allows you to create that structure and, and then you can see it can just break down different uh, areas and positions. And, and then basically on that configuration, you're going to define leadership, you're going to define relationship between people and that clearly defines governance, uh, a chain of command. So that's important too, because as we see in many of those instant we have, uh, you know, they try to 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 uh, deceive people by not clearly define a responsible. So who going to be accountable when something happened according to an environmental uh, accident or whatever impact, environmental impact or social impact that you have uh, in the organization? You need to clearly define this kind of a structure where people can see a visible chart where you know who is accountable for the decision making on those companies. So, uh, second very important thing, uh, then we have defined the, the body responsible for SG, you have defined the positions, the, 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 the responsibility, then you are enforcing the, the, the visibility of those positions. The second thing is how you enforce that in your operations because you're going to have a lot of processes, a lot of things that are going on in the organization. 
initiatives, action planning. How do we enforce that? Then I, a second tool that I see as essential is using process driven uh, uh, shards and automation. So basically what we do, we create workflows to control how the activities to bring visibility to data, to bring accountability and to orchestrate and to have full traceability. So just gonna uh, double click here, I guess that I don't know if the, the, the screen is going to be updated. Just let me know, please. Can you guys see the new screen with the uh, amplified uh, process? No, Jess. Oh, sorry about that. It's supposed to upload automatically. Let me stop and share again. I guess you can see now. Yes, there we go. So the workflow engine is where all the action or events you be planned. Here I'm showing an innovation management. That's very important when you're going to talk about keep improving collecting new ideas. So what does the workflow or the BPMN process automation allows to enforce governance? Because as you can see, every swim lane, you're going to define which department position team is responsible for. So when you start a new event, that could be a problem investigation, can be a new idea for the committee, could be suggestion, could be a, pro, a, a instant handling, a problem handling, you know exactly that every part of that initiative have a responsible team, accountability, and the system you trace all the activities all over the execution. So that's a very practical way to enforce governance because if you have a structured process, an automated process, you have a clear beginning, you have a clear end, you have all the interaction, between all the steps, all the information can be orchestrated inside of the workflow. So then you have visibility, you have all the data that people need to have to take decision, all the approvals, who approved, when, did, uh, when that person approved. Then the workflow is a fantastic tool to standardize operations, bring visibility and accountability to all type of events you do in your organization. So basically, from a committee meeting where you have a starting the meeting, you have all the minutes and information, action plan you take on that committee that gets all connected to that workflow. And then you have full traceability from the beginning to the end of any initiative you have. So workflows are a fantastic tool for enforced governance, keep things standardized, keep traceability, bring visibility, and, you know, and also monitor things in real time because the workflow will show which activity is being executed in a given time. So basically it's a kind of a GPS of every initiative. You can monitor what's going on in real time. You can see the visibility, you can see the accountability because you know who is responsible for that. The system you track, even IP address, all decision uh, and approvals you'll be tracked. The, the also you're gonna know what kind of a information that person had when they took the decision. So this is a fantastic way to uh, define uh, um, uh, and enforce governance into organizations. The system you control also the revision cycle when you change workflows and all kind of features to keep people aware. Okay, let's get back to the original slide. I guess let's just change here to. I guess that is very clear. We need to have executive support. You need to define ESG, uh, uh, a governance body with responsibility and commitment with all, and also spread that all over the organization.
As a second step, then we need to define our ESG goals and objectives. So one of the things you need to have your materiality assessment. So you need to conduct a, a, a assessment to identify and prioritize ESG issues into your organization. That will depend on the nature of the business. Based on the nature of the business, you're going to do the assessment. What kind of a uh, conduct uh, of materiality assessment in, in how the type of uh, activities you do if, uh, on a social side, environmental side, and the governance. And then you need to define goals or set goals. You need to know what you want to get. So define a clear and measurable and time-bound ESG goals that align with your organization's uh, mission, values, and overall business uh, strategy. And then you need to integrate your business strategy with your ESG goals plans. So basically, you need to break it down on your strategy, tactical, and operational, and connect those goals to what you want to achieve. Okay. So you're going to create and define that. You're also going to define uh, uh, the measurements and what you want to to improve. Uh, that's like an initial step. That's also mean to be improved uh, uh, over the time. The third step is define your the, the, the framework that you're going to be using, then you, based on that, you're going to define your policies and procedures that need to be clear, that need to be communicated to the whole organization. I'll go, I'm going to show later because this uh, keep going back and forth to, to different screens. It's going to, to get a bit confused. And I, I'll, I'll finish the steps and then I'll go back to show some of the screens that how a software, how soft expert uh, does with, with uh, deal with every one of these issues, helping your organization to automate and bring out the visibility. So when do you define your policies that need to be communicated to all the, all, not just to the direction, but all down the chain to all those users, all those stakeholders and shareholders, because everyone that needs to be committed with that. That's a very important thing. You need to get everybody committed. Here, you clearly have to have a document control uh, uh, solution because, uh, you know, this is an on, on, ongoing process. You know, it to be, we need to, to polish those policies. You need to improve according to the change of legislation, according to the change of the status quo of the organization. So you need to have a clear way to uh, revise that content it communicate every change you do and also have like a change management workflow. So depending on the change you do in your policy, you need to change things the way you do things. Then you need to do a change management connected to change you did in a document. Our platform allows you to do this in a very seamless way, integrated. So since you change the document, the system will notify all the interested parts about that change you did on the policy, on the procedure, and also the system can plan or, or schedule training for the new policy, the new uh, guidelines, or new uh, procedures, and then take the training to all interested parts, communicating them, saying, yeah, you need to read this new policy. You are in, involved on that new document and need to be trained. How the system you control from the change onto the document uh, until the training, even applying a test to see if people just grasp that knowledge related to, to the change on that policy or procedure. So having a document management, you help any organization to deal with updating things in terms of content, in terms of document, and having everybody on the same page because every change you do, you need to guarantee that our interested part are aware of that change. So the system you do that, I'll show. And then you're going to define your KPI. So basically the KPIs are part of your balance scorecard and that's a very important part. You can define which framework you're going to use. You can use GRI, you can use SASP or other framework, but as long as you define your, uh, your, your framework, then you need to create your KPIs. Many KPIs are very intricate because some of them you're going to measure, for instance, how you measure carbon uh, footprint so how you measure your carbon consumption for any process, that's uh, a very more uh, advanced thing. 
but in our platform, you have a, a library of KPIs, all aligned with the uh, ESG KPIs, where you can just select the right KPI and, 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 and then they, you calculate that for you. So basically, you have your policy, you have a procedure, you have your goals, and then you start to break down at the level of KPIs. And then you're going to associate those KPIs to the areas where you want to measure. Remember, the KPIs are very important because if you want to improve or if you want to have data that are truthworthy, that are you know uh, precise, precise and accurate, where you can share, KPIs are fantastic too. But the way you collect that data also is very important. So how you collect data? Uh, in our case, the KPI can read data from uh, ERPs or other systems. So you can just automate reading of some data. It can be manually inputted by responsible uh, users. It can be collected through the workflows. I'm going to show you the workflow for like uh, collection of data. The collection of it can be very flexible. You can create a, 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 a uh, apps for collecting data in different formats. So this is a crucial step because basically we need to collect data. We need to collect it in the right way. We need to be precise. We need to be accurate in terms of data. And then you can start add that data to our KPIs, bring visibility so everyone can see that data in real time. When you see the data in real time, you can take actions. So you define your plan. You break it down in objects, you break it down KPIs, you connect KPIs to the areas that you need to measure. You start to measure, then you need to monitor that in real time and take actions. So basically our platform allows you to take action when you have any deviation on KPIs. It can do automatically or because the system, you show you how the, the scorecard with all the KPIs, then you can clearly see deviation and you can take action based on that data. So. That's the importance of having a proper collection of data and make it visible. Because when you make visible, you are communicating all the, the shareholders and stakeholders that information, that bring transparency and real-time data that can be uh, 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 analyzed. And then you can use even uh, artificial intelligence or other technologies to improve that data or improve the way you're going to uh, 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 act based on the data you have. So if you don't collect precise, if you don't collect proper data, you don't, you don't have any, any uh, subsidy to, to, to take action. So first thing, collect data, make it visible, and then take action. Then you also can define goals to reduce like uh, energy consumption, water consumption, waste consumption. You can reduce all that uh, using, because now you are reading, you have the numbers. Going to the next step, uh, this is, as you guys can see, all the steps are kind of connected. You need to communicate and engage is take internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. So the community need to be involved and all people need to be that, uh, see that this is not like just organizational thing uh, in sense of uh, the, the business. It is people related thing. So everyone is responsible somehow even to uh, see and denunciate things or to participate in initiative that's going to reduce having new ideas, improving new ideas to uh, save energy, to, to, to engage people in social uh, uh, events that you have uh, on the social side. So internal stakeholders need to be involved in also external. So how do you communicate to your investors your community, because sometimes your your organization are not showing all the initiative they have in terms of helping the society around them. So that is the context of organization. They are part of the society. They are accountable as a member of society, and they need to you know be accountable and they need to communicate not internal and also external uh, uh, stakeholders. So communication is fantastic step. What tools we offer here on that sense? So first, uh, the system 
you orchestrate all the communication, so all document procedure, giving training. There is a learn, man a learn management system built in where you can upload videos to make people aware of the environmental impact, the social impact of governance. So people can do training. That's a way to engage people when they see, they learn, because as you see, culture is very important. So people need to be educated. They, they have to see themselves as also responsible because it's not like an initiative just for the top uh, board. It needs to go down the chain and people need to see they are also part of that and that they, they, they need to feel this, this uh, part of it. Then they, they get engaged to the organization, engaged with the initiative. So the, the, the solution pre uh, also provides you surveys. Then you can just trigger those, those surveys based on the subjects you want to, to, to deal with it. And then people, you answer those surveys and you get back that data for the social side, for environmental side. So those surveys, they are connected also to the workflows with other parts of the system. But basically this, uh, the, the surveys, you collect feedback from your internal and external stakeholders. And then you can, based on that feedback, you can take actions. So this is like a, 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 a ongoing and a cycle. You receive information, act up and see the effectiveness of that, of the actions you take, and then you see the feedback again. That's a way organization can improve and communicate using tools like uh, as soft expert uh, ESG solution. So this is very important step. Uh, get the stakeholders, the internal and external, involved and committed and engaged with the with the initiative. And then, of course, you need to a data management system implemented. Basically, what we offer is all the ways or different ways to collect data, integrate data, and mine that data. So basically, when you have the data, we have a business intelligence component that can play around with that data. You can slice, dice that data, in, and we can define dimensions uh, uh, and measurements, to create different charts to you know, bring visibility to that data and bring intelligence to the data. So basically, when you have the data, then you can just create, you can compare, you can uh, define a uh, better strategy based on data. And that's why we have a very strong API to import data. You can import data using integration, using a spreadsheet, using other kind of a, uh, engine for integration and input data directly from equipment. So there is a lot of ways you can just handle data, bring it to a platform with a single version of the tool because you don't have different disparate system. You have one platform, one single version of the tool. And then you can just go dive on that data and create panels, create charts. And now that you can just publish in portals. I will just show portals into the uh, application. But portals are essential because portals are a way you're going to communicate the data that you did, uh, the, 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 you know, you can report the portals. They, they are uh, a way that like in our system, it works like a social not the network. You can share portals, you can uh, follow portals, you can define as your home portal without the data, without the charts, that, well, the measurements, all the initiatives. And that is fantastic because now you have a system that can collect data, make it available, and take action based on science of that data. Monitor and measure performance. That's all we've been discussing. So using uh, automation and uh, artificial intelligence. So here, when you have the data, then you can find some artificial intelligence tools to help you to a, a, you know, improve accuracy and efficiency uh, of your data that you're going to use to your ESG. And then you need to, of course, the idea of having a, 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 a scorecard with KPIs is being monitoring that uh, because this is uh, the idea of collecting data and, and showing that data in portals where making them, them visible uh, is to monitor and take action up on, uh, the, based on that data. And again, uh, the let's just also a performance review. So based on that monitoring uh, of that data, 
You need to conduct regular reviews and assessment on uh, your ESG initiatives. You can reevaluate your, 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 your progress uh, and see uh, what you're doing against your goals uh, and you know, use findings to adjust strategies and, and improve performance. So this is the idea of having this solution. And I'll show how our solution can help you in that sense uh, uh, because of traceability of all the workflows and all the, the meetings that you have into your SG board. Again, I already mentioned that transparency is a, one of the most important things because if you bring transparency, more people can see the data, analyze the data and help you to improve. So the idea of showing all the initiatives you have in place, all the data you have collected helps to bring visibility and help people to take action over that, that data. So transparency is very important. Uh, even using even using the workflows that we can just get back and see every single action or every single activity you have on that workflow, who was responsible, what data he, he brought to the system. And all this kind of a thing brings transparency. So people can see exactly what the action, who start the action, what the progress of that action during the time, what information people had, what comments, what history. All of this is available in our workflow. So you can see comments during the workflow, so people can just interact during that uh, event or during that uh, 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 workflow and how that get record, get tracked. And then you can trace back every single action you did and you have full accountability over the ESG initiatives. And basically uh, we'll be using the portals and uh, automatic uh, uh, reports, you can always uh, communicate that to your stakeholders. So that's a... Uh, uh, you can define the frequency, like monthly, uh, weekly, uh, and that the system can also automate this kind of a communication. Feedback loop. So after, uh, we already talk about that uh, during the this, but you need to always establish this feedback loop, input from stakeholders, and refine that uh, and enhance ESG strategy and practice. So that's a very important step. As I say, it's a it's a uh, continuous step. So always being reading the data, actually up on data, get feedback, get input and improve. And also benchmarking. So you can also, that's a very important step. You can also compare your, your ESG numbers to your competitors or to other companies in your sector, see if you're doing well or not, because comparison is a very nice uh, way to see how you perform. So uh, that's a very important step, benchmarking. And innovation, as I said, that workflow that I've shown you, innovation, how you encourage and innovation, how you drive people to, to be you know, uh, uh, actors on that uh, innovation step. We have, well, many of our customers won awards based on innovation using our workflow because the workflow is a very, I would say, uh, uh, fantastic to to motivate all people in the organization to record new ideas. So basically the ideation workflow allows you to use your mobile, start the workflow, say, I need to have a new idea. And then you just start that idea. And yet when you record it, describe that idea, you find some parameters to, to, to add a new idea. And then you, when you submit that form with the, the application that you go for a committee, that you analyze that idea, see the, 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 the visibility of that uh, uh, idea. And if it's, you know, uh, you know, it's a winning idea if you go to the implementation. So there is budgeting for that idea, all orchestrated by our workflow. Also the not approved idea can go to a database where it maybe it's not the best time, but you have, you keep that idea on your database. These workflows bring you this, the, the fantastic to, to drive to innovation. Because people just, they know you can make anonymized or you can just, people can identify themselves. And from the whole organization, they can access that workflow, start uh, recording new ideas and the system you orchestrate. So you're not going to lose. Sometimes you have people that are a little bit shy to go to a committee and, and say about their ideas. But if they have an application where they can type and, and start that idea uh, registration, that could be much more democratic in sense of everyone in the organization can have access to that app and start recording new ideas and that you drive you to innovation and improvements. So basically, again, I said, 
workflows because the workflows standardize things, they bring them visibility. In terms of the third line of difference, so of course, how you guarantee that what you're doing is accurate, is according to what your requirements are for uh, uh, for uh, your ESG framework, then you need to conduct audits. In that sense, the system allows you to define a library of requirements. So then you know every requirement you need to comply with in terms of ESG. You can use uh, the if, uh, other uh, ISO 40001, for instance, and define a requirement based on that for environment and also other uh, 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 standards. You then you have your library of requirements. When you go to audit the system, you can create the audit based on those requirements. Okay, so that's very important. So we have all this integrated. During the audit steps, then you can take action. Again, when you're doing your audit, when you have a finding, a non-conform, the system it, it force you right away to start on that same screen a non-conformity investigation, problem investigation, or action plan to deal with that specific non-conformity, and then you have a full report. Since you detect the findings, so you can get all the findings from a specific audit. When you have all the findings report, then you see all the action plan dealing with those findings. So we have an end-to-end -end solution again. Basically, the system can help you doing the audits. You're going to reduce your paperwork because the system will prepare all the requirements for the audit based on your library of requirements. You just select the items from your library, and then this, the audit is going to be ready to go. And then during the execution of audit, you can do the planning, the scheduling of that the, 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 the audit uh, during the year, define the responsible for the audit. The system also you control that uh, uh, execution uh, step by step. In the end, you're going to have all the information available in reports, prepared automatic reports, and, and all the action resulting of that uh, uh, audit. And then the tenth step. Uh, that's so the idea of companies that needs to start. They need to start in a small scale, a viable, feasible. Uh, and then when you get that, uh, you know, working fine, so wow, now it's working fine. You can scale. So the system enables you to duplicate scorecards for different business units. Enables you to define uh, uh, scale different uh, uh, business units inside of the organization of Shark, then you can just scale and, and, and adapt to the new uh, uh, regulation to change on the ESG. The system prepared that the, that uh, a library of requirement that I've uh, mentioned, it's able to revise it according to the new change on the legislation. Uh, and that, that's this uh, adapt to the change that you come and keep the system retro alimentation uh, on, uh, on, that, on that sense. Uh, Dili, how, how long time I have? I just want to show more slides from the presentation or now from the system itself. You, you, you're fine, Jess, you, you can go ahead for now. We'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> okay, fantastic, thank you. So while Jess is bringing that up, Jess is actually doing a live presentation via the internet. And I see one of the questions was, can you take this to company websites, et cetera, portals? The answer is yes. So I was just mentioned that workflow for ideation. So this is how the process you help you to automate all kind of, all, all kind of automation. And down here, just let me get to uh, the system scorecard. I guess you guys can see that screen right now. Yes, yes, yes. you can, Jess. Let me see if I can. Uh, is that the screen you can see? So here is where you can define scorecards for your KPIs. And then let me get to the portal.
Can you guys see the portal right now? I see. We can see um, the idea creation page. Oh, let me sh stop share and I'm trying to find the window share here on the on the on the share. Um, did you say screens? Okay, so okay. I guess. It's so this is page. fantastic. Thank you. So here, here is uh, the one of the portals we already on the platform, and as you can see, we have a portal list here. So you can see portals from social data from your ESG, energy data collection, material data collection. Okay. Uh, also my tasks. So it's very important how the system you orchestrate all the events, all the actions you have whether it be a workflow activity, uh, uh, audit activity, a, a, a document revision, all those tasks will be orchestrated by the system by sending emails and adding uh, tasks into the system. So the system send you an email, say you have a specific uh, task to perform, whether it be uh, document revision or collecting data, very important. So when you configure the collection of data, the system, you define who is responsible for collecting, like the, the energy data collection or the water or the waste. And then that person, you receive an uh, email and you define the frequency and also a task, internal task into the system, like this one here. So those are internal tasks. As you can see, I have audit tasks, document tasks, performance tasks for measurement. So that's important because you need to have a system that, you know, orchestrate that for you and you know bring reminders to people and bring accountability because the system, if they don't do the task on the day, the system can escalate, send a task, send a, 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 a message to his leader or to his peer, depending on your configuration. And then you provide the engine that allows people to be accountable and take action before things go wrong. So every task you be sent by email, by internal task, every task is, is scalable. So if the person doesn't execute on time, the system you show, See the colors here, the red are the late ones, the yellow was on the due day, and those are on time. So the system always allows to filter and also allows you to transfer tasks to different people if, uh, you know, for some reason that person cannot do the task. This is a very simple part where I have shortcuts to my social energy material and many other portals. So if I go to energy, This is a nice balance scorecard where you can see a portal with all your energy consumption, total energy consumption intensity. Uh, so we can explore that data, you can drill down that data. Basically, that's what I'm talking about, bring visibility to your data. Uh, here you can see a very clear portal, but here you have a workflow for data collection. So if I click here, the system can record the date, the name of the, the responsible for the data collection. Okay, this will happen automatically, but just want to show you how you proceed with data collection. Mm, that screen is not, uh, it's not loading up on the, I have to stop share and share again because it just uh, stop sharing. Uh, I'll share again, no problem. Then you can see this. Sorry about that. So when they open up that workflow, the system will bring this data collection. This is very, I'm just showing for uh, energy. You, can, you have for water, for other kind of materials, and you can create your own data collection. But what's important here? First, that can be automatically triggered. So the user you be responsible for that, uh, that uh, is responsible for that collection. You receive email task reminding him with the link to that screen. So the system says you need to collect data. And there is a deadline for that. You can define deadline in our escalation gene. Here you can just define the data, the, the, the initial period, the, uh, the end period of data collection. Uh, there is a lot of things related to 
to, to the data you're going to collect. So here you can define the business unit that you are responsible for collecting the data. And then you can define your energy data input. And here there is a lot of configuration, not gonna go on through this, but basically you're going to find the type of energy that you are reading, if you like a fossil type. So that's all data that helps you to define in your ESG strategy. What if you are using clean energy? So what your consumption on clean energy or uh, on fossil fuel energy, all this can be configured in the workflow and then you collect that data. That also can be integrated to pull that data from other systems that you already have that data. Or if you have a person that has the, 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 B, the, the, the view account on his hand and just type that, or you can read using capture engines. So just you scan those files to a folder and the system is able to read that folder, read the, like the, the, the view, and uh, as a PDF or image and extract the, the, the value and all these things and automatically uh, up, upload that data to the form. But if you look at the, the workflow, so basically here, if you got a problem here, you can start a Ishikawa chart to handle that uh, problem doing root cause analysis. Or you can take an action plan here and then you can start or associate existing action plan to that initiative. Let's say you have an initiative to reduce uh, energy consumption. Then you can just associate that action plan. The action plan, you orchestrate a different team where you can monitor tasks on real time and they receive also tasks related to their initiative. So action plan are fantastic tools uh, uh, to communicate and orchestrate internal uh, actions. You can also, let's say you have the, the copy or you have a PDF version of that file, just can drag and drop it here so that you have the evidence of the readings as a, as a PDF, just drag and drop to this area then to get that document started. You can look at linear history. So since the first collection of data to the last, so get all the data, can define comments on that. And when you are done, you just click end the measurement and then the system will just upload all the charts with that measurement. So all those charts you see uh, here on the on the on this portal will be uploaded automatically. So I guess it's stopped the share. Let me. So also on other tabs you can define your tabs here. Then you can see other things you need to observe. So here you have your balance scorecard. So you have all the scorecards are the KPIs you want to measure. See, I want to see the total energy inside of the organization, outside of the organization, energy intensity, reduction energy consumption, it, it, those are KPIs. Uh, energy scope, energy so those are different KPIs you want to associate to the energy KPI. But remember, besides those, the standardized one that according to GRI report, you can create your own KPIs and add to that balance square card, okay? And then you can have the total energy inside, outside, a specific consumption, uh, and then you can create another chart. With, you know, this is very easy to play around. And as I said, the portal is shareable. So you can share the link, you can define the permission set, you can export it, you can put the presentation mode, and then you don't need any PPT to presentation. Just go with the full screen, you can control what you show here. So portals can be followed. As you can see, you can define several portals and you just can follow them. And for every initiative, you can have a portal. You can see our initiatives and treatments here on the other tab. So you can start a new initiative and treatment. So this is another workflow that you can start. You can see all the data related to that. If you want to start, you just click here and start a workflow that you orchestrate a different uh, initiative for treating, let's say, reduce or, or changing. Uh, this you orchestrate the, the people that you define on the configuration. So basically you can start new initiatives by, uh, by starting that workflow. That workflow can be also start in a mobile. So you can just start that clicking that button or you, the system can use that in mobile application. So people don't need to use uh, uh, just a laptop or, or a computer to start. They can be using your tablet or, 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 or mobile phone. Action management, so you can see all your action, track your actions. So you can see all the action, the status of those actions, if they are the priority, the, 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 the actual percentage of execution of those action planning. 
see all the action plan that I have, those that are on in progress, this didn't start yet. So every icon, there is a specific information. Uh, a very important part, how you handle risk. So here you can also connect with the risk component where you can handle risks into your environment initiative. So as you can see, the system, you pinpoint the specific risks where the last evaluation was. You can see if, like a card. So then you can see by premises or by business unit, by asset. And then those cards, you can see the risk you have. And now so you can see the controls you have. And you can see if the control is effective. You can see the, how you test those controls from here. You can also click here and go to the controls and go to see the frequency also here, very important. In every, every event that the system handles, it always enforces accountability and visibility. For instance, for those controls you have established for that risk, every control you have on there, a person responsible for that control, the system you send him message say, you need to test that control. And the system define the frequency he needs to go and measure and, and, and test that control. Also, if the test fails, he can take a action right away, okay? So the system has a full risk management platform. This risk management platform is being used by financial sector, for food and beverage, by pharmacal industry. So it's not just like nice charts. It's go very in depth in terms of risk management. You can connect those risks and also due to the, the holistic approach of our platform, you can connect risk to your initiatives that are projects system have a project management to your processes. Remember those, the process, you can go to a specific process activity you mapped and say there is a risk on that activity. You can associate risk to assets, very important for the mining industry. So you can define what kind of risk you have in your assets. We are looking at the context of ESG. So what that asset uh, can, the risk can impact your ESG strategy. So that's how you manage your strategy uh, not used in a chart that you define strategy in the paper. This you have the strategy, but the, that strategy you be monitored on real time because you can connect strategy to your measurement KPIs. Then you connect your measurement KPIs to a risk. So if that KPI deviates, then the system you say, hey, there is a risk here, and you send message to all the responsibles for that risk. Also, every risk you have a responsible, like the controls. So there is a guy that will be responsible for that risk. So everything that goes on, you're going to receive notification. So basically, from your strategic side, where you define your, your balance scorecard as the organization, as ESG strategy, connect them to your objects, break them down in KPIs, measure those KPIs, take action, notify, do effectiveness verification to see if your actions are effective, test controls, connect to, to other systems to pull data to retrofit your system. So basically, there is a lot more, but to see, you can see risk, opportunity, controls, treatment. All you can have into the portals. Portals are fantastic because basically you define them as home portal and all that information visibility that you can share with others. Then you can provide your GRI report with accurate data, with accountability. That's why the system you provide. I'm not mentioning how it, you handle document process change. So if you process, change a specific process, also the system, you, you uh, control the revision of that process. You make people aware that the process has been changed. Many sorts of problems where people change a specific process, uh, operational process or strategic process. And then uh, people are not aware of that change and can do things wrongly. And that is a source of non-conformity and also problem to the organization. So. Also process are, con are connected to document. So basically every process can have a policy, let's say a procurement policies. That policy will be alongside with the process. So when you start a new procurement process, you can check the policy to see if you're following all the, the guidelines, all the, the, the requirements for that uh, procurement. So that enforced governance, because the, the moment you are opening a new procurement, new, a new purchase request, you have a policy alongside with the process you just check that on the on the, the process and see the policy while well, I'm doing everything right. Or you can have like a standard operation procedure as well. And now, so when you change those documents, let's say the document owner changed the document, the system will automatically update that document on the process, the procurement process. So you're never gonna be using a outdated document. So all this integration allows what we call the single version of the truth for organizations. 
Of course, uh, the RCS is being used not just for ESG, it's being used for many other things, uh, for pharmacal industry, for uh, food and beverage, for financial sectors. So you have a system in that sense that is being tested in many different areas, uh, and it, we go very deep in every area. And the integration yes. between elements uh, uh, are fantastic. Yes, uh, my time is up. I'm afraid so. Thank you. I know there's a lot, a lot of depth, and um, yeah, that you've really tied everything together very eloquently, and the integration of all that details. Yeah, possibility and very powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce our last speaker, Ian Huntley, who is co-founder and chief technology officer at Rifle Shot Performance Holdings. Um, he has over 45 years industry experience and has assisted many companies in, in energy mining and manufacturing um, sector to save millions of dollars by squeezing that extra percent yield where it's really um, making a huge difference in, in small amounts. He's finding the detail. I'm going to pass over to Ian straight away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, let's just put some video on so you can also see me. I'm a real person, not not an AI image. Okay, so I've got the enviable task of um, effectively taking you through the how and and why we're working with us. So one of the things about rifle shop professional services and the whole company was founded 23 years ago on the basis of being a professional services company that uses technology to aid our customers. You see around the border of this slide some of the customers that have been with us. In fact, many of them have been with me longer than the company has been around. But an important part is our solution partners in the center, again, we've had many long-term, hugely mutual, beneficial relationships. And when I say mutually beneficial, it means for our customers, ourselves, and themselves, helping them grow um, their businesses, but also to adapt to the the variations within our market and the unique requirements. And every industry and every market does have uh, different items. So within the professional services, I want to just show you a few cases at a generic level. Caroline? There we are. So we've got some sample customers. We're, we're hiding the names of the culprits. Some of them are on this call. Um, but again, these are treasured customers that have been with us a very long time. We've done a variety of functionalities on the right hand side. And of course, this whole ESG is an important wave. So in the early days of the company, quality was a big issue. And we helped uh, many companies drive and model their processes coming out of the COVID lockdown health and safety was a big issue and very similar processes um, in terms of the services delivered so given that there's a shortness of time I'm not going to go through all of them um, but I think the key thing that I want to point out on this slide is as we do the advisory we agree on the journey map which I'll go into a bit more detail on. We spawn on time, on budget projects that are an exact fit. So many professional services companies do a lot of the same things. So I would say 80% of professional services from various companies sound, sound very much the same. One of the 
values and we talk about values and contributions a lot within rifle shot and we review it so the whole subject of innovation how do we bring innovation and you'll see a lot of trademarks on some of the processes and um, things we do stuff that we've come out of the market and said hey customers need that so innovation innovation for yourselves as customers as partners um, innovation within ourselves and again uh, the goal is to get better results that whole subject of continuous improvement the business and alignment and growth how do we help you drive the wanting to do it you know we spoke a lot about culture in the panel and further further down in jesse's section but to me it's absolutely key and then how are we going to road roll out that roadmap and we talk a lot about journey it's one of my mantra words you'll hear me talk about it an awful lot how do you know that you're getting to where you want to go in a structured and coordinated manner we talk about bridgetalization a lot of people have either paper or spreadsheets and things but how do you have totally integrated processes and again um some of the predecessors on today's talk talk about it and then of course it's not a point in time particularly with esg it's an emerging set of practices and you as practitioners us as practitioners soft experts as practitioners we need to be working with you and growing this key part of the way we work is you pay us for results. So let's give you resultants that give you the results. Uh, and again, it's it's a it's a practice, it's a value that we have. Within our customers, they there's a single point of contact, what we call a spark, um, and that covers a lot more than just the engagement around a single project it's around the growth of the project the seminars like these that hopefully enhance your knowledge and depth of of the domain keep keep part of it and it's all part of the continuous improvement if you stand still you go backwards let's just get my mouse on there so a question, will you survive the challenges of being a world-class player? And ESG is a critical part of that. So the first thing, my button isn't going, let me get that gone. Okay. We spoke about looking at top-down and Jesse made the point. That's a very critical point. Caroline, could I have have the build? You should have control now, Ian. It's not controlling. And it's saying I'm viewing Caroline's screen. Okay, I'm going to remit. Let's see. There we go. You should have it now, Ian. Yep. Okay, great. So let's go to it. So will you survive being a world-class player? I don't have control. It's gone away. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay, let, let me talk about this one while, while we try and get back um to normal programs when we talk about the challenges of being a world-class player and dsg in particular same for quality and the others as a company at the top level as um the c-suite reporting into our shareholders into the market into the environment you need a whole level of um of of detail you need stuff your management underneath it needs to be able to look at the data 
And unless you can model it correctly, I'm going to see if I can't do that. I'm going to give up remote control. I really do need this. Unless you can model the data at the different levels. So we spoke a lot about getting the right data in the right level of detail in real time. That is likely to come from many subsidiary systems and be fed into a tool like Soft Expert, um, where that can be then modeled at the different layer of management. And then to be able to build on that within context. So we, we have a standard procedure where we design from the top down, getting down to the level of detail that we need. Thank you, Caroline. Maybe if you can just drive it and I'll ask you to do next. So if you look at this, we've gone from the public data to the board, the shareholders, the operational C-suite, going all the way down. We design top down to the root data. That results in in time and in detail. Then from there, we build up with, with the assistance of um, team, our own team and um, the soft expert team, we build up the bricks of the wall of your data so that it becomes decision support, that it's in context and you can make reliable and accurate decisions. You can do um, forecasts and predictions based on that. Next screen, please. It's been spoken about a lot. ESG is a journey, so hopefully you'll work with us and initiate a project shortly and you get to a basic level of maturity, then intermediate, advanced and on to master. I think you should have seen in Jesse's presentation that the functionality is all there to be able to grow and work with it. So we as, as Rifle Shot Professional Services will work with you on that and help help develop it. Okay, next screen. That roadmap is, is really critical. So typical engagement path. So to get something up and running, we do a discovery, we do some maturity and readiness assessment. We help draft your roadmap, your proof of value, success criteria. How do you know you've won? And then we do a pilot project, a thin slice, lessons learned, and we keep expanding from there. Next. Phase two, typically we update the template. We prepare for a rollout to other sites um, to incorporate their data, start thinking about adding additional functionality. But what's really critical is the whole change management plan. Unless people buy in and the that it becomes absolutely pervasive in the culture of the organization, it's going to be a challenge. You don't want to be forcing top down the whole time. It's very tiring, very draining. Next. Then what about the other levels of IT, OT, ET integrations? What else could we integrate? How do we mature the system? How do we add lots more of the workflow automations, because as much as possible, this should actually be automated. Last phase. And then how do we go to proactive? It's very nice looking backwards and most auditing looks backwards, but how can you use the tools to be proactive, to go out into the market and prepare, to make sure you don't have those instances that could cause so many problems? So last slide for me. So the initial ESG engagement, we typically will do a maturity assessment, draft a URS a roadmap, set up your um, proof of value concepts. We of believe in our project management office. In fact, we use the soft expert tools. We didn't even touch on those today to manage our own project management office. And then we look at the whole enhancement how do you keep growing because growth 
is really there. So let me hand back to Dilly, Caroline and Dilly, to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, it's um, a collective effort and certainly a journey in all aspects where there is tons of detail to consider, which certainly can be quite overwhelming. Um, I know that we have just reached 12 o'clock um, and I just in the interest of time, I do know that everybody is busy and has actual hands-on jobs to be doing. Um, Gina Dilly, are we going to continue and answer some questions while everyone is still on the line? Yeah, I see, Caroline, there's some people on the line. And I think if there's some pressing questions, uh, we could answer them. I did see a few in the in the chat box. Uh, and I think it's largely directed to Jesse. Uh, so, so if you want to manage that, Caroline. Sure. Um, okay, so first of all, um, one question was, can customized reports and dashboards within Soft Expert, Soft Expert be automatically presented to stakeholders via a company's website? Yes, indeed, it can be. Uh, customizer, that is the business intelligence components allows you to create customized reports. Basically, all the data you have, it just drag and drop very easily and can create customized report without being like a expert. But then if you have like a DBA person, uh, also he can do advanced thing, use the SQL uh, uh, report. So it's all available in the two. Uh, there is a data model where you can use, but there is a lot of ready-to-go reports where you can uh, send them directly to a uh, portal or you can uh, configure it by email to send by email to, to those that you want to send. Thank you. And then question, um, does using systems like this typically prompt upgrading of other business systems? Operating systems, general ledger, obviously, whatever is integrated. And is this done in tandem or in sequence? So if if you are if you're talking about integration, then we have web service that integrates integrates that in real time. Okay. So we can or based on events. So when you need the data, some even that need the data it goes to the other system, pull that data, bring to the, 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 the form. Uh, I don't know if that was the, the question, but I think that was uh, regarding integration and uh, uh, that was, so there is online real-time integration. You can also use uh, import and export uh, tools for like exporting a spreadsheet from other system, importing as a suite, or even getting that, uh, that is an engine that can go to a specific folder, pull uh, the spreadsheet and import it automatically. Okay, thank you. And then um, how would you incorporate stakeholder and supplier feedback into your own soft expert system so that you know the information you're getting from them is correct to prevent unintentional greenwashing? Is that possible? So basically, you know, the system support external users, those workflows, they can also be driven to uh, external people to upload data. But of course, uh, to ensure that that data is accurate, then you need to audit. You know, the two is uh, you bring it accountability. So you know, we upload the data when he uploaded, what data he has, so you can ask for evidence. Remember that is a screen that you can just drag and drop uh, the image, PDF, or videos then they can just add that as evidence. Uh, uh, but you know, audit is the best thing then, uh, and then the system can also create a kind of an audit. You can create a supplier's portal to monitor all the portals, all the supplier's uh, data. Uh, the system handle external, a special type of user that's called external users. So this is fantastic too, because it basically it handles all the security layers that's necessary for external users to access the platform. 
Okay, thank you. And then last one, um, can ESG initiatives within the system be managed as projects, including risk management? Fantastic question. Uh, I guess I mentioned that uh, when you define your balance scorecard, you define initiatives, uh, you always can end up having a project connected to that. So every KPI you see on that balance scorecard can be connected to a project. Okay. So basically you can use project and not just project, project integrate with the workflows. So even during the project execution, you can have action planning, all the documentation handled by the system, all the risk. You can select your project structure and go to the risk model, uh, risk component and do risk identification on your project activity. Then you can create controls on that. So yes, and there is multiple levels and, and, and ways to do that using a platform. Mm, wonderful, thank you. So, yeah, it's clear um, from the questions, from the conversations, from all the presentations that all the elements of sustainability are hugely complex and highly emotional issues, actually. And um, we all know that when emotions run high, IQ tends to jump out the window. Um, and having a system like this brings us back to a place of logic and practicality to make the best decisions. And I think that ties back to enforcing accountability so that when somebody external or internal asks, what were, what were you thinking? You're able to answer that with clarity and incorporate regulatory policies, corporate frameworks and workflow systems so you can show the detail. Love it. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank everybody for your participation, for your input, um, for your questions. And just let you know that wherever you are on your journey, whichever phase you're at, um, and if there's anything anyone is struggling with, please do contact us. We are, this is a collective effort and Everybody in this room, I um, think I can speak confidently on everyone's behalf, is here to support each other. I hope Caroline, you do. What I would like to suggest, Caroline, um, you know, uh, we've got a community. I think there was 120 people that registered to attend. And, you know, there's this term that says slowly, slowly, suddenly. Uh, and, and, you know, it's suddenly now. ESG is here. And what I would like to suggest, Caroline, the community that you have now, the 120, that we actually create a family, if you will, uh, with this community moving forward, where we can share information, we can learn together. We have the tool. We know that. We use the tool ourselves. So, so this is one suggestion. Uh, the other is, you know, you spend two hours with us of your valuable time. So think about it. Look at some of the key things. What are you actually going to do about this as a next step? So we are here to, to assist you to walk on this journey. So please contact Caroline. And in closing, I would like to thank Michael, uh, Alex, and Jürgen. And Buenos Aires to, uh, to Jess, who's joining us all the way from, uh, from Spain. And as you could see, he did the demo in, uh, in real time. So this could be worked very, very well on, on the on the web, within your portals, in your organization. So thank you all. Thank you, everyone. And take care. We'll be in touch.